Coming up on Virginia Currents, take a trip to Wallops Flight Facility, one of the oldest launch sites in the world. It's still active as we see the Rocksat X and the OA-5 Antares rocket take off into orbit. And we visit a sweet place called the Sugar Plum Bakery. They provide employment opportunities for those with developmental disabilities. Also, the impressive murals and artwork by Sir James Thornhill during his visit to Daphne's Corner. Plus, the catchy indie folk music of Wilder, all coming up on Virginia Currents. Welcome to Virginia Currents. I'm Daphne Maxwell-Reed. Wallops Flight Facility is one of the world's oldest launch sites. It originally started launching rockets under NASA Langley in 1945 with an expansion in 1959. The facility currently stretches over 6,000 acres with its bread and butter being suborbital programs which include scientific balloons, sounding rockets, and airborne science aircraft. We visit the facility on two special occasions, the payload launch for Wallop's Rock Sat x program and the launch of the OA-5 Antares rocket. The Rocket Sat x program is geared towards students. The purpose of the program is to offer hands-on experience that can be taken from the classroom and transferred into jobs and careers once the students graduate. 2016's program hosted students from Puerto Rico, Wisconsin, Virginia, and Hawaii, just to name a few. The Antares OA-5 launch drew visitors from across the globe. This rocket was being sent to the International Space Station, carrying supplies as well as payloads from scientists, universities, and high schools. Copy. Today is an educational payload uh, called Rockset X. Uh, we do this in cooperation with Colorado Space Grant Consortium. So we have eight universities that are involved in the project. And it takes about a year for them to develop their, their payload. So the idea is to, to develop their skills. And this is a follow-on to the Rock On and Rockset C programs that we do with them. What happens with this type of payload, the, the students are responsible for building the experiments. So they have kind of like the size of a hat box uh, as kind of their envelope in order to build an experiment and it would fit into that size. And then here at NASA Wallops, we're responsible for supplying the rocket motors. Uh, with the payload, we also are responsible for the recovery systems, any of the batteries. Uh, we're also testing some, some new technologies for sounding rocket uh, that may fly in the future uh, with this particular experiment, you know, flight. So uh, it's a little bit of everybody involved in this. To elaborate on what ours is, it's a software-defined radio payload. We're, we're testing um, a software-defined radio module, a consumer off-the-shelf or COTS, to transmit from space to both uh, our ground station here at the launch site as well as um, our ground station in Blacksburg, Virginia, where our school is. The idea is to show that this the technology can be used on commercial and government satellites. Communication with satellites is something that's really expensive, and this would be a much cheaper alternative. So if we can prove the, um, the validity of this kind of communication device, then it would really drastically lower the cost of satellite communication. In our payload, we have this new design of a clamshell, and we will, we will see if the, if the methods that were used to design it were effective if it survives the, the heat, the vibrations, and everything. Well, basically our experiment consists of collecting micrometeorites from the meteorite trail and then taking them back to the Earth and into our laboratory to analyze and sequence them to see if the, the peptides, the amino acids, proteins, anything that we find in space are any different from the ones that we already know uh, that are in Earth. Hmm. Oh, 
I was awfully nervous. Uh, it's relief, I think, uh, to get it to get it to fly. We actually got our hardware up there. It survived the launch, um, and it's a uh, we have a deployable antenna that's actually deploying out the rocket and turning. And we were worried for um, a little bit that that would survive launch because it uh, takes about 20 g's of vibration force through launch, and so. Um, and the fact that our antenna survived and we were able to actually transmit, we transmitted about 32 bits of data, which isn't much, um, but it means we had a successful uh, connection with our antenna and our ground station back in Blacksburg. I feel accomplished, like seeing the rocket fly with all our payloads inside, it's really fulfilling and exciting, amazing, I don't know. <laughs> it's awesome. We're thankful for the Rockset, uh, Rockset X Group for giving us this opportunity. It gives. Uh, universities across the country a cheap way to get actual hardware into space and it was a fantastic opportunity we all learned a lot at Virginia Tech and we're looking forward to next year's launch with a brand new mission. Throughout NASA I mean the idea we want to try to to encourage students include science technology engineering math and and the rock on uh, Rocksat C Rocksat X program is one of those programs that we get those students uh, to understand what is really involved and, and get them to, to get some hands-on learning. Uh, it's nice to have the book sense, but to get that hands-on learning is, is something different. So we were working to not only educate students uh, through programs like this, through internships, but also educate teachers. And then the teachers can, can, can go out and educate the, the younger students and get them involved to understand that Science is cool. What drew me to work over here at NASA in general is just space, technology, that sort of thing. Uh, the, the unknown of, of the universe, you know, being able to be a part of being uh, at the forefront of, of human space flight and uh, just being able to go out to space is really cool. This is OA-5, this is Orbital Antares rocket. Uh, they've launched from here numerous times. The last time was two years ago, October 2014. Uh, we're very excited to have it here. It's carrying the Cygnus cargo. Uh, we're hoping everything goes well. It's been two years uh, since the 083 crash. We've got a lot of experiments on there, both from scientists, universities, high school experiments, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we've got supplies on there, food. Wallops is one of the main resupply stations. Kennedy Space Center through SpaceX is the other. So uh, just, you know, just basically ensuring that the astronauts up there have everything they need uh, in a timely manner. They're up on the space station. Uh, so thanks very much for picking that song out for us. And you're very welcome. Oh my gosh, I have been so very fortunate to be a NASA astronaut and have the opportunity to fly in space twice. Astronaut Kay Heyer on the right holding the handheld laser. First of all, as humans, we're just curious. We need to know what's out there. But specifically on the International Space Station, we're doing studies that benefit everybody here on Earth. We're doing all kinds of studies in a different type of a laboratory. This laboratory does not feel the effect of gravity. Therefore, we can grow things and do things there and to look at something from a totally different perspective. Uh, this is a great mission. Uh, the extended day while docked was very important to us. It allowed us to complete more of the work that we had planned. And for instance, on my first mission, I took human leukemia cells with me and we grew this on orbit because if we can understand the way it grows, we might be able to understand or figure out a way to intervene and stop the growth of cancer cells, let's say. But we also, on the International Space Station nowadays, we have different vaccines that we're developing, and all these things that we're doing do help us further our efforts to explore space further, but also spins off into different technologies and understanding that can benefit people right here on the surface of the Earth. And I really hope that more people get that experience to fly in space and most especially young students, and I think that they will. You know, some of our young school children nowadays are gonna be of the age that possibly could be the ones that are the first humans on Mars, and we, we hope they come and join our team and help us get there. Well, certainly space exploration, most people think of astronauts and scientists and engineers and, if you will, very geeky people. And there is a lot of that. And science and math is very important, but you know, we need an entire team. In minus 10 seconds. Photographers, videographers, artists, accountants, lawyers. My first space mission, I flew with a veterinarian. 
So we need an entire team of all different types of talent. So just because math and science might not be your favorite subject, you still need to take those courses, but there may still be a place for you on the NASA team. So come join us. Crowd watching the uh, launch at Wallops there. If you want to check out a launch firsthand, visit nasa.gov slash wallops. Sugar Plum Bakery is a nonprofit organization that has been training and employing people with developmental disabilities for nearly 30 years. The bakery was founded by Reverend John Jordan, Carl and Deborah Marshall, parents to children with special needs. The three of them felt that their children had great potential once they got out of school, so these parents decided not only to create opportunities for their kids, but to provide opportunities for others with disabilities as well, to be as independent as possible. We visited Sugar Plum Bakery to meet some of the staff and ask them why they feel they have such a sweet gig. I enjoy myself every day when I come here. Made me feel so good. Oh, I like making money. And I like come here every morning. Like mopping. Clean this whole thing. Make it spotless. I like to meet new people or something like that. I feel it's important to have opportunities, especially employment opportunities for people with disabilities, because so many people, they really want to work. And now you hear the, the bakery. I'm out working hard, and you know, I got my money sweat. Um, I'm gonna uh, um, feel like making stuff like cakes and cookies and scones and uh, everything, I guess. I would demand uh, the plan. I think people undervalue the meaning and the desire to have the camaraderie of what a job brings to you and earning a paycheck and being independent. And these, this population wants the same thing that we all want. At Sugar Plum Bakery, we strive to employ people with disabilities and to prove that this often underutilized population in our communities can be a valuable part of the, of the bakery, of our community. It allows self-worth and independence for a population that's really underutilized. We feel that this population can really be part of something special and everybody learns a little bit differently, but that doesn't mean that they can't learn. We work with their strengths and don't focus on weaknesses. We have several programs at the bakery. One of them is a program that's for individuals that have Medicaid waiver and they work with a job coach in the bakery. Now we're moving into what's called group supported employment. And these individuals work with one job coach and they do different jobs at the bakery, but they work together as a group. Then we also do have individuals who are able to work independently and that's individual supported employment. Then we also have a job coach that is employed here who works with the Department of Rehabilitative Services and clients are referred to her to help find jobs out in the community. So a lot of the people that you may see at the grocery store, you know, they're bagging groceries or maybe working um, stocking shelves or working in a pharmacy or things like that, a lot of those individuals work with the job coach. And, uh, and then the job coach helps them through the whole process of, you know, filling out the application and going through the job interview. Um, and then once they get the job, she actually helps them and helps the employer so that the individual um, knows what their job is and knows all of the skills that they need. Okay. It's a really great um, organization because there's so many different skill levels at the bakery. If somebody is lower functioning and all they can do is build boxes and stamp bags, well that's okay because we need that. We need the boxes for cookies and cupcakes. But if someone is higher functioning and they can read a recipe, then we have that too. They just do so many different jobs like greasing pans or washing our dishes. You know, cleaning up, I'm um, helping customers. They're just an integral part of what we do at the bakery. It's a dream job I work here. I never had a job before like this. My favorite thing makes people happy. The fact that we're open to the public and people can actually see an integrated work environment is so wonderful. What's really special about us now at being here for almost 30 years now, when people come in to the bakery, 
they came in with their parents when they were younger and now they have kids and are coming in to the bakery. So to see that full circle moment is really wonderful because you think if the community, we wouldn't be here without them. They are supporting us and supporting our mission and continuing to buy our products which help us to do what we do of supporting these individuals with disabilities. And we're also educating the public about the worth of this wonderful population as well. So that's, it's definitely a, a full circle moment and it's really important and it is very special to see that and we get to see that daily and, and that does mean a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Trish. You're welcome. <laughs> We're more, more the same than we are different, I think. You know, there's more, it's not, it's just, it's just, they're, it's just learning differently. They have the same needs and desires and wants that we all do. They really do and they want, they want a full life just like we do and, it's, and work is part of that, you know, earning a paycheck going out to a dance or going out to the movies with friends, you know, and being able to do that, living, you know, on your own and being able to have your own space. That's all really, you know, it's important to us, it's important to them. All right, Annie, we're almost there. One thing that is amazing about this population to me is they live in the moment and they're, and that's what we all could learn from. It's just being in the moment and take that small, whatever the moment may be. It could be the smallest thing, just smiling at someone or saying good morning, you know, we're having a, you know, have, we could be having a bad day and then you just say good morning to them and it makes their day. Um, so this population really has taught, taught me to be, be in the moment. I think the biggest advice that I would give to parents um, that have children with disabilities is to realize that we are all not gonna be here one day and, and that's just a reality. So we want to teach as much independent as possible and these guys can do it. You know, just lose the apron strings a little bit, and I know it's really challenging because um, you've, you know, you've watched this this individual grow up since they were a baby, and probably a lot of times you've been told they can't do this and they can't do that, and you just got to push that out of your mind and know that that with proper supports and in a nurturing environment, they can thrive and they can fly and they can meet all of their dreams. To find out more about Sugar Plum Bakery, visit sugarplumbakery.org. Virginia Currents TV programs can be seen anywhere, anytime at ideastations.org slash Virginia Currents. And to hear Virginia Currents radio stories, visit ideastations.org slash Radio Currents. Welcome to Daphne's Corner. Joining us today is Sir James Thornhill. Sir James was born and raised in historic Jackson Ward in Richmond and is an artist, muralist, and photographer. He studied oil, acrylic, watercolor, and oriental painting, along with theater arts and fashion at VCU, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and John Tyler Community College. He's created over 20 murals in Richmond and has photographed and painted all over the world. We welcome you, Sir James Thornhill. Well, How thank you. are you? Welcome. Thank you. I'm doing fine. How are you? Now, Tell me about growing up in Jackson Ward. You're not old enough to have been there for bebop and all the rest of that. So tell me what it was like when you were growing up in Jackson Ward. Well, it was quite experience. Always something exciting to do. The produce um, dealers, the car dealerships, we always had something going on in Jackson Ward. Most of my inspiration came from artists who actually lived in Jackson Ward. Uh, inspired by other artists in the different media? Yes. On Saturday mornings, you hear the, the produce dealers out there selling the, the, the ware. They'll, they'll come up with things like watermelon, cantaloupe, three mashed potatoes and salt pork. Every morning you hear things like that going on. Mm -hmm. You heard construction work going on. It was just a creative place to be inspired by. And what got you started on the art track? It's hard to say, Daphne. It was always there. I was always doing something. Mama used to call it piddling. Mm -hmm. In um, elementary school, never took a real interest in academics. It was always drawing, so much so that my teachers started having me doing bulletin boards and decorating um, other classrooms. It was instinctive, I guess. Did you start with painting, sketching, or photography? I started with sketching. Mm -hmm. And um, as I got older, the photography came. Mm -hmm. But painting, sketching, Anything I could do, pencil, crowns, um, I started off with uh, those basic things and then afterwards we moved to photography. Now tell me, when you started painting murals, was it at your suggestion or someone uh, asked you to dress up a building? <laughs> um, someone called me and asked me would I consider painting a building and I'm like, wow, this is it's, it's huge. Um, 
And I started thinking to myself, I did some research, and um, I realized that you paint a, a building one brick at a time. I like painting large scale paintings anyway, so why not take it a step higher? So I get there one day, I look at this large building, I'm like, wow, <laughs> how do we get this thing done? And it came back to me one brick at a time. So it was a suggestion. Never thought I would ever be doing murals 40 feet to 60 feet tall. And what subject matter did you choose or did they choose? I'm a historian, so most of my murals are of historical people who actually built these areas. Like in Jackson Ward, about eight murals are dealing with people who actually built and helped to um, cultivate that area. Mm -hmm. So most of it is, is historical. Pieces. And how did your acting get into the middle of your uh, painting? <laughs> My acting, um, well, it just, it all came natural, you uh -huh. know. Um, most of this is, is not something that was planned. It, it's sort of like, you wake up one day, here it is. I worked at Philip Morris for 33 and a half years. I'm retired now, right? Oh, so you had a real job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a real job. So um, even working at Philip Morris, I was going to school, learning things. When I came out, I had all the time in the world. So it's like, it's not planned. It, I just get up, one, get up in the morning and say, okay, these are the projects I want to do. I call people together and we get it done. Wonderful. I love this. What is it called? Serenity. Ser it's beautiful. Thank you. And this is a live model you painted? Do you yes. photograph first and then paint? Yes. I, I couldn't sit there. I couldn't let you sit there and I just um, stopped painting you because after a while I'll, I'll get kind of nervous about it. But I, I take the photograph first mm -hmm. and then afterwards we'll go through it with the model and decide on which one we want and then the painting began. Is she uh, serene in a specific environment that you created? Well, if you look at it, you see a lot of things going in the background. And this, is, this painting has more going on in it than any of the paintings I've done. Um, and it's, it's hard to make all that work, but if you look at the colors, everything goes together, it blends well. You look at the bottom of it, you see the roots of a tree, and then it gets more mature with the leaves. And then as you get up here, you start seeing African symbols, God is, God is energy. Uh, it's called serenity because of that serene look she has. If you look at it, it's almost like an Egyptian pose on this as well. It is. And then you see the African, the kente cloth there. Ah, uh, very much historical and yes. bringing a lot of disparate history together. Yes. Are you still going to be working in Jackson Ward um, or do you like traveling the world better? <laughs> I like traveling the world, but um, because I have a personal interest in Jackson Ward, because I was born there, mm -hmm. and in Richmond you see so many people moving in. It's great, such a good variety of people moving in, a good diverse um, group of people, and the city's changing, and some is for, the, for, for a good, for good but we are losing some of that history, I feel. So my job is to make sure that the kids coming up nowadays are gonna remember those people who worked hard to make our city what it is. So right now, I'm on his, this historic um, kind of role where my thing is going into the community, bringing some rich history to those kids so they won't forget it. Because when they walk out the door, if they see nothing, they don't remember anything. That's so right. why not give them something that's gonna inspire them to say, if this guy did it, I can do it. I mean, how those kids remember people like Maggie Walker and other people, but what about the rest of them? Yeah, you, you know, Mr. Gilpin, you know, um, the, the, um, you, you look at the Consolidated Bank, you got three or four bankers and we painted them on the wall. And it's so nice when kids come past me like, well, who is this guy there? Get a chance, Perfect. an education opportunity. So what are you most proud of that you've done so far? My four <laughs> kids. Ah! Um, <laughs> Well, I, I'm proud to be one of the first aviation artists from my group to paint, to have a piece in, in the Pentagon. Oh. I'm really proud to be able to do these historical features because wow. it means so much to me because these are unsung heroes. Yes. When we did the Major Taylor mural on First Street, he got international recognition. Wonderful. His family called us, his friends called us. I'm delighted to be a part of this whole thing. Wonderful. To find out more about his work, go to sirjamesthornhill.weebly.com. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I can't say if I am ever coming home. Today's Spotlight on Music shines on the band Wilder out of Washington, D.C. The indie folk band has been together since 2011 
and debuted their first album, Rain and Laura, in 2016. The band performs regularly in Northern Virginia and has received rave reviews. Here now is a video of the song Sunstroke. Thanks for watching Virginia Currents. Join us next time for more inspiring stories. I'm Daphne Maxwell Reed. In love, who I wait in the sun. If I am ever coming home